climate change. It's something we hear about on a daily basis. There's always a new article coming out about it. There's always something linking something else to climate change. Before I go any farther, because I already know people are pissed at me. People are like, this guy doesn't believe in climate change. I do. I do believe in climate change. Climate change absolutely exists. And not just climate changing over time naturally. Human-caused climate change 100% exists. So don't get it twisted. Don't eviscerate me in the comment section about how I am a science denier. It exists. Human-caused climate change exists. Good. We're out of the way of that. Cool. What I am going to say, though, is that the people who tell you how things should be fixed don't have the solutions themselves. And the solutions that are oftentimes brought up are just like when a politician says they have a solution for how to fix the problem. You look at the bill and there's a bunch of extra caveats in there and you're like, well, why is this money going there? And why is this money going here? Oftentimes it is an excuse for people to put money in places where they want it to go and to control certain bits of the population or to scold you for being a bad boy or girl. Unfortunately, that's the way it's turned. But why am I talking about this? A channel that I very much like, Animal Logic, has made a video talking about climate change and the effects it's having on certain animals. And we're gonna go over that and I'm gonna give you my two cents on how I think about the particular points that are brought up. Because as I further my education and I see how the scientific process is supposed to work, I have run into a wall with how many people claim that the scientific process needs to go this way, but when it benefits or leans a certain direction that they agree with, it doesn't necessarily follow that route. So without further ado, I'm going to do my best animal logic impression. It's supposed to be a polar bear. I tried to draw a girl in a dress to be Danielle Defoe, but I, I'm sorry, that wasn't meant. To, it is literally, I, I'm just, anyway. Climate change is a word we use a lot, but still bears defining. It is the change in average conditions, like precipitation and temperature, in a region over a long period of time. Climate change itself is a natural phenomenon that occurs as the Earth cools and warms over millions of years. The reason that climate change has become such a concern in recent decades is that due to human activities since the Industrial Revolution, our climate is changing way more quickly than it would naturally on its own. This super speedy, human-driven change in average conditions, also known as anthropogenic climate change, threatens to cause a whole host of issues, from flooding to drought to intense heat. If unstopped, it will lead to the mass extinction of thousands of species that aren't well adapted to this new climate in the next century. I do appreciate that they gave not only the definition, but also talked about um, how it's a natural occurring thing, because oftentimes that's just thrown out the window. A lot of people don't talk about the naturally occurring part because it does. It's changed <clears throat> since humans have been around. It's changed multiple times. Some, in fact, are thriving in the face of this anthropogenic climate change and are using it to their advantage. Many of the creatures benefiting from climate change are those that live near Arctic ecosystems one of the regions most affected by climate change. As the Arctic warms, trees are migrating northward from the forest belt, which is completely changing the landscape of the formerly cold and barren tundra. While the tundra used to be too cold for red foxes, which have long ears and limbs that allow them to lose heat quickly, these warmer temperatures across Europe, Asia, and North America have allowed red foxes to move their range further north over the last 70 years. As red foxes move in, they threaten the survival of the native Arctic foxes because they can outcompete them for food. So while the red fox flourishes in its new range, the Arctic fox is being pushed out of its range by that same success. Now I want you to listen to what she said. Because the temperatures are warming, the red fox has been able to move its range up north compared to what it used to 
and is now starting to compete with the Arctic Fox, who cannot outcompete it because the Red Fox is just better adapted at the competition in that space where it could live. Now, the Arctic Fox, not having to deal with this competition throughout the evolutionary process, has not needed a way to learn how to outcompete something like a red fox. So think about all of what I just said and what she said. I, I said the same thing as she did. We're going to notice a trend here moving forward, and I want you to notice it every single time she talks about a specific animal that is outcompeting or moving into a new range. Is taking advantage of warmer temperatures and an advancing tree line by moving further north. Historically, white-tailed deer, which are the most abundant wild ungulate in their range from North America all the way down to Northern South America, have made their homes in more temperate climates. The reason white-tailed deer avoid extreme cold is that below minus 17.7 degrees Celsius, they start to shiver to stay warm, which costs a lot of energy. If they aren't able to find adequate food to replenish the energy spent, it's just not worth it to live in temperatures that are consistently lower than that. With rising temperatures, however, they can move further north into the boreal forest. Further north is great for them since it opens up even more feeding possibilities. But it could have a huge impact on the flora of the boreal forest. Along with the deer come the wolves, which spells disaster for the already threatened boreal caribou, who call that area home. As if that wasn't bad enough, white-tailed deer also carry deer ticks and a brainworm parasite that is harmless to them, but deadly to endemic moose and caribou. So while the white-tailed deer can't imagine their luck at having a whole new zone to comfortably invade, the consequences for the rest of the ecosystem are significant. Okay, once again, warming up, the deer, the white-tailed deer specifically, can tolerate in these areas that they weren't able to tolerate much before. So they're able to extend their range. They themselves doing very well in that habitat now that the temperatures aren't so bad for them and they are able to move up north. A, either out competing the other animals or bringing new parasites and new things that the animals that live in that area aren't used to. Also having wolves follow the deer northward and certain species such as the caribou which are already struggling with their numbers, have multiple new things to compete with. So we got that. I've summed up what she has said. I haven't said anything else other than summing it up. Pacific salmon are also adapting to a warming climate by hatching earlier and earlier in the year. This in turn directly benefits the bald eagle populations that rely on the salmon run for food. Studies show that the earlier the salmon run, the more eggs a bald eagle will produce which means populations have the chance to boom in the face of a changing climate. That's a good thing. I mean, considering the fact that, like, I I know this is anecdotal, but I'm seeing bald eagles everywhere around me. Like, I'm in the Tampa Bay area. You don't think of nature that much when you think of the Tampa Bay area. But when I tell you that from Pinellas County, which is, like, one of the most densely populated counties in the state of Florida, all the way up to where I am, you know, not too far north of there, I see bald eagles every other day. Like, I see them routinely and i didn't used to see them when i was a kid so they are making a population comeback so that in and of itself is a really good thing nine banded armadillos have been consistently moving northward for over a century but increasing temperatures have allowed them to expand their range upwards towards the northeast if their advancement continues they could be thriving as far north as new york city within a few decades so while the idea of an armadillo exploring the streets of New York may be an adorable notion, not all creatures that are moving north are as welcome. So speaking of this, this is another anecdotal thing. Um, I didn't realize this. My wife is from Tennessee, and when I first started going up there, we saw nine banded armadillos. We have them all over here in Florida, and like usually you see them hit on the side of the road. And she said to me, until a few years back, they didn't have any armadillos. And I'm like, really? And she, I'm like, I see them everywhere. She goes, yeah, they've moved up and now they're just everywhere. I did not realize until within the past year and a half that armadillos were making their way up north. I thought they were already there. Not that I'm aware of too much damage. You know, people like to complain that they dig through things, but like I had no idea until very recently that that was a thing. So I found that very interesting. Due to rising temperatures, ticks are also expanding their range north 
at a rate of about 35 to 55 kilometers per year. This introduces a whole new barrage of tick-borne illnesses to people in regions that would otherwise never have to worry about them. This includes the Lone Star Tick, which has become infamous for spreading a disease called Alpha-Gal Syndrome, a potentially life-threatening condition which makes the sufferer allergic to red meat. Another anecdotal situation, right under my, my tit hair, right under here. Uh, I, uh, I was walking through the Ocala National Forest a few years back and coming back from the hike, you know, you check yourself for ticks and I had a little tick under my, my nip and I took it off and I looked at it and it had a little gold spot on it and I'm like, I think I've heard of this before and I was starting to freak out because I was like, isn't this the one that makes you allergic to red meat? Sure enough, it was a Lone Star Tick. It was that same species and I just popped it out and fortunately for me, it has to bite you for a certain amount of time for it to actually be able to pass that on if it has it so i've been eating red meat since and i am not allergic so i got very fortunate there but i have been bit by those guys when it comes to benefiting from climate change it all comes down to how quickly and easily a species can adapt to new conditions that right there what she just said it depends on how quickly and easily a species can adapt to new conditions so after looking at these species that are thriving despite climate change you may be wondering if the planet is going to be okay after the human-driven climate crisis has snowballed out of control. Just because a species seems to be doing better now does not mean they'll survive when the whole ecosystem crashes and burns in the wake of global warming. As always, our focus remains on preventing the disaster before it happens so that all species have a chance to live out their natural course. All right, so to really hone in on the point of what I wanted to make with this video is that animal logic is great. Do not go after them. This is not a hit piece. This is not anything. They are fantastic. They do a great job. The issue I have is that, especially in the beginning there, backloading, talking about how one animal will do very well and then how other animals are going to be severely hurt by them or potentially it is very true like all the stuff she's saying about the things that are happening are true statements but i really want you to think about something humans see the world as we see it today and we want to keep it that way and to the extent that we are causing problems i 100 percent understand the need to keep things as natural as possible and let natural things take their course but how the evolution of animals has worked and has always worked from our understanding of it is that when a new challenge comes up in an ecosystem whether it be a changing climate or a new species they have to contend with that species will either be outcompeted and go the way of the dodo and disappear or they will adapt and be able to survive past that and do something different. Now, one of the issues we have right now is that we are introducing a bunch of invasive species all over the world. When an invasive species comes in that's vast, vastly different than any other animal in that ecosystem, there is no way that the animals can adapt quick enough for the most part to be able to compensate for that. Now there are examples like snail kites here in Florida, a new snail species, a new apple snail species, I believe it's from Asia or Africa or something like that. It's bigger than the native ones that we have here. And they are out competing the native apple snails. Now the snail kite only eats these snails and their numbers drop drastically until it started being realized that they were eating the new one. Well, how are they eating the new one if they were only adapted to eat that other smaller one? Well, their beaks started getting longer and it happened over a very short period of time. And now they're starting to bounce back a bit because they were able to adapt to the thing that was happening to them. Now, that is a man-made reason we brought those snails here. But you have a native animal, an animal that got there naturally all on its own like the white-tailed deer moving farther north. You have animals that have not been doing well for a long time, whether that's because of humans or not, such as a caribou or certain populations of caribou, and the deer are either out-competing them or bringing new predators or whatever. They are naturally coming up here, and you can make the claim that it's because of man-made climate change, and it might potentially be, but those deer got there naturally. They weren't brought up there. They are migrating. They are making their way up north. As much as we don't like that that environment is now changed for the caribou, 
that's just the way that the animal world goes. You either learn to compete, adapt to compete with those new challenges, or you die out. 99% of the world's animals are extinct because they were either not able to compete with the new challenge, the climate changed, whatever it may be. Now, of course, the argument is, well, humans are causing this. And I, I don't totally disagree with you. At some point, if it keeps on going the way it's going, and eventually, however long in the future, it's that we can't survive here, humans will die out. And then whatever is left, will either have adapted to be able to take over that habitat and will repopulate. That's how it always has gone. There have been mass extinctions that have wiped out 90% of life on Earth. I believe what the great dying, it might've even been more than 90%. Most of the animals on Earth were wiped out in a very short time period. Yet we had one of the biz biggest explosions of new animals on the scene ever that we see in the fossil record. My point is, is that thing that bothers us is that we are the ones who are kind of driving this. The, the earth will be okay. That does not mean I am advocating for not doing anything to stop the issues that we have created because we absolutely 1000% should. The fox is another example. The red fox is moving up north for whatever reason, whether it be because the climate is warming or not, they are making their way farther north. That is a fact that is happening. The Arctic fox, which is a very specialized animal. It only lives in these areas because it has adapted to survive in those specific areas. When something is a niche animal, it is the most vulnerable to extinction because that niche, if it changes at all, could wipe out the entire population before they have any chance to adapt. And the red fox being an animal that is a more generalized predator, it doesn't need as strict of a condition to survive, is able to outcompete the Arctic fox when it overlaps in the same territories. Now the worry is that the Arctic fox will go extinct. I don't want them to go extinct. I hope they don't. But in the natural process of things, if that red fox outcompetes that Arctic fox and it goes extinct, that's the way that it's gonna go. Now please, go into the comment section and let me know how wrong I am, because I'm sure plenty of you do, and some of you might be angry at what I'm saying. But the whole point, if you listen to what I'm actually saying, is that humans do play a factor in climate change and some of these things that are happening. Absolutely. But animals going extinct has happened throughout the world's history. Through Ever since there's been an animal, Ever since there's been adaptations and an animal adapting to a new environment, another animal got pushed out and went extinct. This is a natural process that happens. We're used to the world being the way we know it and not used to the world in the way that it's always been, which is things come up, things adapt, they thrive, and if they don't keep on adapting to deal with new situations, they go extinct. If we can save it, and we can do something about it 100%. But if an animal is naturally going to a new place and outcompetes another animal, that is just the way the world is. And it shouldn't be looked at as a terrible thing. It should be looked at as that's the natural process actually working. Let me know what you think down below. Like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Some of you might hate me now, but I see this as a natural process. And we should see where it goes. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you liked it. And I'll see you on the next one.